We are in the book of Romans. And uh, we're in the middle, or we'll actually cover the rest of chapter 2 today. And uh, the beginning of chapter 2 starts out and it says, Therefore, O man, you are without excuse. And so, it's beginning to, to talk about the fact that we are without excuse. And last week we talked about hypocrisy and how we would judge others but not necessarily want ourselves judged. And then in Romans chapter 2, in verse number 11, the Bible says this, for there is no partiality with God. Now when we read that, at first glance, by itself, with no other context, That sounds great, doesn't it? God doesn't play favorites. But when Paul wrote the letter to the church at Rome, he didn't divide it up by chapters or by verses. Because that's not how most of us write letters, right? We just write it out. Now, if you're doing it correctly, you're supposed to use grammar and sentences and divide and then group those sentences in paragraphs. Some of you are having flashbacks to English class. I've reverenced this before, but when I started dating, and then really, I think when I got married to my wife and I joined her family, then I joined a fraternity. That meant that I uh, was was gaining the benefits of being part of her family. And what that meant in her family is I started to get letters from her grandmother. And her grandmother uh, was this old lady who was born and raised and lived in East Texas. And man, when you would when you would meet her, she would just say, hey, y'all come on in and give you a big hug. And, and she was just a full of life. And then I got a letter from her. And I thought it was almost like it was from a different person. Because Miss Kane was not just from East Texas, but she was an English teacher. And she was like old school, it, dearest Daryl, things here are well. And I mean, the grammar was perfect. The punctuation was exact. And it was, it, was, it was great to receive a letter from her. The book of Romans is just, a, not just, it's the inspired word of God, but it's a letter written to a church from the Apostle Paul. And so we need to understand that verse 11 does, in fact, have a context. It's a sentence that resides in a paragraph, and the context is judgment. It's not, hey, God doesn't play favorites, everybody's good. It's God doesn't play favorites, nobody has an excuse. And so I want us to continue where we left off last week, And start in verse 12 of Romans chapter 2. It says, For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, excuse me, in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. But show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And again, Paul is writing, introducing himself to this church in a town where he's never been. And so he is presenting what he preaches. And that's why he says here, my gospel. But the things that I I want you to understand, first of all, is this. Verse 11, that there's no partiality with God, that would have been a pretty shocking concept to both Jews and Gentiles at the church at Rome. You have to understand that society at that time. I understand that we live in a society where people talk about privilege and inequality and and those types of things. And I'm not saying that those things do not exist. But in the Roman society, those things were taken for granted. 
first of all, from the Jewish perspective, and we're going to talk more about this as we go on in this passage, they were God's chosen people. God did play favorites, and they were the favorites. From the from the Gentile or non-Jewish perspective, half of all the people in Rome were slaves. They weren't people, they were property. Absolutely, there were haves and have-nots, there were favorites and unfavorites in the society in which they lived. And so for Paul to write and say, there's no partiality with God, that would have, been, that would have stood out as a shocking statement. We view that as something we would affirm. But to the the church at Rome, they would have looked at that and said, what? Well, of course God's place favorites. I'm a Jew. I'm God's chosen people. God's already told me I'm his favorite. Well, of course God plays favorites. I'm a free man. I've been blessed. That's God's blessing on my life. I'm obviously better than this person over here or that person over there. But Paul is going, is attempting to unravel all of these ideas. And as we talked about last week, the primary emphasis of of chapter 2, I believe, is to the Jews especially. And so Paul begins by talking about the law. Now, again, we have a lot of different thoughts when when we think of the law. You know, if you're like me, someone says the law, and in your mind you go, I fought the law. And the... Yep, some of, you, some of you are right with me. Some of you are like, I never heard that song. That must be an oldie. It is. That song's actually before my time, but anyway. But to the, to the Jews, and in this context, the law is very specific what was given to Moses on Mount Sinai as he led the Jewish people out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. Beginning with, as we think of it, the Ten Commandments, right? But then on top of that, all of the Hebrew law. What God dictated as how they ought to live as a society. Because God had promised to take them and make of them a nation. But when they went into Egypt, they were a family. It was Joseph's family, right? His brothers, his father. But they multiplied as slaves in Egypt and they came out a nation. But they were a nation with no history as a nation. No values as a nation. And so God dictates to them the law. This is how you ought to live. This is how you ought to conduct yourself with each other. This is how you ought to solve disputes. This is how you ought to worship me and how you ought to, uh, what our relationship is going to be like. God sets out the law. And in that, the Jews looked at that because they had received a message from God. They knew how to live above all others. And so they valued the law. The problem is this. The law only shows our shortcomings. The law only shows our sin. You know what the law was? The law was one of those signs that they put on the road that flashes your speed, and if you're going more than five miles an hour, it doesn't even flash your speed. It just flashes the red and blue lights. Do you know that sign? Not far from my house on Youngsfield, there's a sign like that. And when you're going down Youngfield, the speed limit is 35 miles an hour. And to be honest... Everybody kind of is running 38, 40 miles an hour. You can't, you shouldn't go real fast through there. There's a lot of lights and different things, but you're doing 35. And then as you get sort of out of the commercial section and there's a few houses there and a tight turn is coming, it drops to 25. And that's just too slow. Amen? And there's, 
And right there is one of those signs. And I know it's coming, and I'm always like, I do want to drive safely, and so I let off the gas, and I might even tap the brake, but still, lights are flashing, buzzers are going off, rockets are exploding, you're going too fast. That's the way I feel. That's kind of what the law is. It's like, hey, man, we have, a, we have a law here, and you're not meeting it. Because nobody could keep the law. That's why Paul says, for as many have sinned without the law will perish without the law. But if those who have sinned in the law or with the law, they're judged by the law. Either way, we're sinners, and we're, we're, we're going to receive judgment. Galatians put it this way in Galatians 3 and verse 10. For as many as are, the, are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Well, that's a quote from Deuteronomy. And he says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God, is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by faith. Verse 11 says this. It's evident. It is obvious that nobody is justified by the law. It's obvious that nobody does right and meets every manner of the law all of the time. Anybody with any sense and, and their eyes open can see that. And he says, rather the just or those who are justified live by faith. We aren't justified by the things that we do or the things that we don't do. We aren't justified by how good of a life we live we're justified by faith, and that faith is in Jesus Christ. And so it, Paul's going to talk a lot through the book of Romans about the things that we do and how we're to live our lives. But that is a result of faith, not to be justified and, and to prove to God how good we are. And so he talks about that the law shows our sin, and but Jesus came to fulfill the law. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, don't think that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but fulfill. One person has lived a life that could be justified in, in his actions, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the only perfect person, and yet he didn't live a perfect life for himself. He didn't need justification. He lived a perfect life as an example to us and then was our sacrifice. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 2 in verse 17 and says this, Indeed you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. He says, and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. And so he talks about Jews and, and what they think of themselves. And then he says, you therefore who teach another, do not teach yourself. You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. I mentioned this in the introduction to our series, but the church at Rome was in a very unique situation. The church at Rome, most scholars agree, was probably started because at the day of Pentecost would have been believers from Rome. And so 
there when thousands heard the declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit was unleashed upon the people. And, and, and people began to turn to Christ. They were saved. The Spirit was indwelling them. God was doing a mighty work. Thousands came to Christ. Some of those who believed were probably from Rome. And so a group of followers of Jesus begins to gather in Rome, this church at Rome. Now again, we have to put ourselves in the context of first century believers. and, And that's difficult for us because we have so much of Christianity with us in so many ways. If, if you're like me, you know, I, I have a Bible on my phone. I have a Bible in my office. Many of you have a Bible in your car. You find it every once in a while under the seat. Or you've got a Bible at home. We have the Word of God. The, the first century church, I mean, Paul wrote the book of Romans, right? All they had was the Old Testament. For many of you, you know, we use crosses as a decoration. Some, I, right as I look around, I see it on shirts, jewelry. That, would, that wouldn't have been in the first century. The cross was not a form, a, a, a symbol to remind us of what Jesus Christ did for us. The cross was a form of torture. You wouldn't have an electric chair or some form of torture and and killing uh, to decorate your clothing or for jewelry. And certainly not with any type of religious significance. And so the church was primarily started in synagogues. It was started where Jewish believers gathered. And non-Jewish believers would come as well. And we'll, as we close out this passage, we're going to see uh, some of the controversy that began to develop with that. But they would come as well. But this was where the Jews would gather to worship. And what would they do? They would read the Old Testament. They would talk about principles of who God was. And now as believers in Christ, they would, they would talk about Jesus as the fulfilling of that, right? The Messiah who was promised and has now come, and that's where their faith is. But here's what happened to the church at Rome. In AD 49, uh, the emperor Claudius issued an edict that all Jews were to be expelled from Rome. And so the early church at Rome had all the Jews expelled. We we know this happened historically, and then uh, we have the Bible speaks of this in Acts chapter 18 and verse 2. In Acts 18, it says that Paul and those that were were traveling with him traveled from Athens to Corinth. And in verse 2 it says, And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. It's this interesting little note in Acts chapter 2 that says, when Paul came to Corinth, he met this guy and his wife. They were Jews, and they had been kicked out of Rome, and they became friends because Aquila was a tent maker like Paul. So they were both Jews, They were both tent makers, and they eventually were both believers in Jesus Christ. But we see here that this early church had all of the Jews removed from it. So now they're Gentiles, and and so they aren't steeped necessarily in, in Judaism. They're trying to figure out what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. By the time Paul writes the book of Rome, Romans, in AD 57, the Jews are back in Rome. We know that because at the end of the book, in, in Romans chapter 16, in verse number 3, Paul would write this. He says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Say hi to my friends, 
that I met in Corinth who are now in Rome. And now the Jews are back. And so it's in that context that Paul is writing Romans chapter 2. And what he's saying is, listen, you, you value the law. You value this direct message that God on Mount Sinai delivered to Moses and through Moses delivered to the nation of Israel. But the law will only condemn you. All the law does is show you your weakness. But he does say in in chapter 2, notice what he says. Verse 17, he says, you're called a Jew. And then he says this in verse 18, and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourselves are, and then he says, you guys as Jews are this, you're a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Listen, there were advantages to being a Jew. They were, in fact, God's chosen people. Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 1 says this, Now the Lord has said to Abraham, Get out of your country for your family and your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. And then God says this to Abraham, I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth, you shall be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God said to Abram, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless your friends. I'm going to curse your enemies. And I'm going to use you to bless all of the nations of the world. That's a pretty good place to be, isn't it? In Isaiah 42, beginning in verse number 6, it says this, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand, and I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. So when Paul says... In the book of Romans, to the Jews, you're a light to those in darkness. You're a teacher to those who do not know. Listen, that was affirmed in the Old Testament. The problem was some of the attitude that could come with that. That the blessing of God could bring about pride. Not that that would happen in our life where God's blessings, we can begin to think we're pretty good. I think about this being in ministry because the the reality is this, as a pastor, I spend my day studying and and trying to um, gain knowledge of 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 the Bible and spiritual things and and I want to I want to be able to preach uh, in a way that 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 builds up the church and that's a responsibility but it's also a great privilege that I have but I don't have any more access to God than anybody else. And any knowledge that I have is only God's blessing, not because I'm so spiritual or because I'm so smart. But sometimes if I'm not careful, I might forget that. In the same way, you might look at some success in your life. Maybe you look at your children. And you see that they're bright and that they're successful in school. They're well-behaved. And you, if you're not careful, might think, I'm a pretty good parent. 
Some of you are like, man, I've never thought that. I'm feeling you there too. But that's God's blessing. You might look at the home you have or the career that you have or some kind of blessing and think, I worked hard for that. And you may have worked hard for that. But we need to understand that those things are God's blessing in our life. And God forbid that we become prideful in those things and that God would have to remind us who it is that really are, we should be relying on. And the Jews, if they weren't careful, could have a tendency to think, hey, we're God's favorite. God's always going to bless us. And they're, if they're not careful, could be some hypocrisy. Jesus said this in Matthew 5. He said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, lamp stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That sounds great, doesn't it? You are the light of the world. And you know, a light's not to be hidden, man. It's to be put on a lampstand. It's to, it's to shine so that everybody can see. Man, I just want to be the light of the world, amen? And then he says this. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, the Jews had a tremendous responsibility because they were God's chosen people and God did bless them, but they had the responsibility to show how we ought to live before God. And it's the same responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus. The just shall live by faith. And if you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, God has poured out his grace and his mercy upon you. Not because you deserved it, but God has forgiven you of the wrong things that you've done. God blesses you. He indwells you through his Holy Spirit. He walks with you. He, is, he has given you an inheritance and an eternity in heaven. God has done all of this for us, and we deserve none of it. But we have a responsibility not to be prideful about it but to be a witness to those who are in darkness because it should be through us that others would see God's blessing and God's working and they would desire that in their own life. And so Paul talks about the judgment that is coming to the Jews, as well as what is coming to the Gentiles. And then Paul closes this passage with a, a section that is a little different for us today. See, there were, there were a couple of things that made the Jewish nation distinct. One was the law. The law that was given by God himself, that instructed the Jews how to live, how to uh, structure their very society. And the other was circumcision. And Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 2. He said, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised 
If he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but is circumci- but nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now a little bit of background here. Again, this is to us kind of weird. But in Genesis 17, God says this, This is my covenant, which you shall keep. God is talking to Abraham. And he says, Between me and you and your descendants after you, every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And God commands, he said, for newborn males, the eighth day was the day. Thousands of years later, in the New Testament, Paul, when writing about how devout he was as a Jew, he would say this, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's one, that was one of his notches in his belt. Now, as an eight-day-old, that's not really anything you do, right? That's what your parents do. Really, what you're saying is the devotion of your parents and how they were raising you up. But Paul took some, some note of that. He said, listen, I was circumcised as it is commanded for Jewish males to be on the eighth day. Now again, <clears throat> this isn't necessarily, it, unless you're Jewish, in our culture, that's not necessarily a religious thing. And to be honest, it's not really something I love to, to talk about in church. But it's in Scripture and, we're, and we need to, to, to address it. But for the Jews, it was an outward symbol of God at work and their dedication to God. And so they took it very seriously. So much so that it became an issue in the church. In Acts chapter 15, in verse number 1, it says this, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. They ended up having a whole council about it. People presented their cases, and it was James that's recorded the brother of Jesus who really sort of gave uh, uh, kind of a ruling that everybody agreed with. But this became an issue because Paul was preaching that if you put your trust in Jesus, Jesus would, you would be saved, your sins would be forgiven, the Holy Spirit would come upon you. And that was happening. And it was evidenced by these miraculous signs that were taking place. People were speaking in tongues. People were getting healed. All kinds of stuff was happening. God was working among the Gentiles, the non-Jews. But then some teachers came down from Jerusalem and they said, no, this isn't right. You've got to become a Jew by circumcision. Then you can be saved. Listen, it can be difficult to witness to people Right? Friends, neighbors, co-workers. Think about if circumcision was part of the package. It would be a tougher sell, amen? You want eternal life? (laughs) You're going to have to have a little procedure. That is not the case, right? I mean, they settled that in the council there. But it illustrates the seriousness that the Jews took circumcision. Because, again, this was a command from God. 
And it identified them as God's chosen. It, it set them apart as God's favorite. They took pride in it. Both pride that wasn't sinful. I mean, God had blessed them, but also perhaps pride that was sinful. And I'll be honest. I think about that. in some of our own circumstances. I think about the privilege that I have to be born in the United States of America. Honestly, I'm proud to be an American. But that doesn't make me a Christian. We could argue about whether or not America is or was a Christian nation But being born in the United States of America does not give me, does not guarantee me access into God's kingdom. I've had tremendous favoritism and advantage in my life. My parents were believers in Jesus. They took me to church as a young boy where I was instructed in Sunday school stories in the Bible, and I heard the gospel so that at a young age I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But unless I made that decision, my parents' faith would not give me access to God's kingdom. And I can thank God for the opportunity and the privilege that I had And I strive to provide that for my own children. Now as my children are growing and two of them are out of the house and one of them I can see the light or the darkness, depending on how you look at it. Some days it changes. I pray for my grandchildren. I don't have any, but I pray for them that my children will take them to church and and model before them a love for Jesus and that they will grow up and come to a saving knowledge of Christ as well. I pray for the children at Belmar Church. Kids that are downstairs, a few minutes ago we could hear them. When I'd take a break, do you hear the noise coming up? Disturbing our services, stupid kids. Man. Right now in the nursery and preschool and downstairs are kids that are hearing that Jesus loves them and they're learning songs that reinforce those stories. And I pray that God will take them and, and, and put the truth in their heart that they will be saved and that they will grow up to be men and women filled with the Holy Spirit that will do a tremendous work for God Almighty. But growing up in church doesn't ensure our salvation, our access to God's kingdom. The reality is only our personal faith in Christ will bring about salvation. And outside of that, regardless of our family situation, our upbringing, our nationality, our ethnicity, we are destined to endure God's judgment if we, don't, if we don't put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3, we read beginning in verse number 10 earlier, but verse 13 says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Earlier in Galatians 3, Paul would say it's evident, it's obvious that the law doesn't justify anybody. And a matter of fact, now he says, under the law you're under a curse. But Jesus has delivered us from that curse. And then he says that the blessing of Abraham, verse 14, might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see, it's not about obeying the law. It's not about uh, submitting to the act of circumcision. 
It's about faith in Jesus Christ. The just shall live by faith. We only have life and justification. We only have salvation and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And that should lead to an attitude of humility and repentance. One of the obstacles that Paul really addresses all throughout chapter 2 here is whether Jew or Gentile, the fact that pride can come in to our heart and our life. And I want to... I want to address it specifically as it relates to Belmar Church. Next week, I have a note to make an announcement. I forgot to make it during the welcome. Next week's our annual business meeting. And I told you last week in the announcements, I'm excited to share what God has done in the finances of our church in the coming last year. I'm excited for what's going to happen in the coming year. Next month, I'll celebrate 15 years at Belmar. When I came, we were $2.2 million in debt. This year, by God's grace, if we continue at the rate we've continued, our indebtedness will be less than a million dollars. We... we weren't able to meet in our auditorium when I first came, and God's restored us to that. We have beautiful carpet, and, 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 and we've been able to do things to the building, and God has blessed us in so many ways. But God forbid that we ever look around and think, we're doing pretty good. Because God speaks to me, in a little bit, you know, God spoke to the prophets in, in still small voices and very biblical ways. And God speaks to me in a little coarser way sometimes. And I'm always reminded of the story of the talking donkey. And God just says to me, you think you're great? I can use a donkey to get my message out. Now, Insert your own meme there. But I'm glad that that has happened while I've been pastor of Belmar Church. But that is, listen, that is not because of great strategic planning, exceptional leadership, amazing financial acumen. That is God pouring out his blessing on our church, period. And he doesn't need me for that. And he doesn't need you. But I'm glad he's using us in that way. I'm glad to be a part of that. Amen? That's just the finances of our church. That doesn't compare to the blessings that God gives to us in the area of his son, Jesus Christ. That in him we live and move and have our being. That in him we have forgiveness of all of the wrong things that we've done. And God forbid that we would gather together and someone would walk into our midst and we would look at them and think, does that person belong here? Because none of us belong here. None of us belong as as the the called out of God, the, the, the saints of God. We are a gathering today of the saints of God. None of us belong here in that regard. You understand what I'm saying? And yet we do. We can can boldly walk in and boldly walk to the throne of grace and, and, and raise our face to God and say, you are my Father, not because we deserve it, because God poured out His grace to us. And so the response to that should be humility and repentance. Not pride and arrogance. Why would we need to put on airs? We know we don't deserve to be here, and yet we are here because of God's grace. And in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, 
I didn't put it on your screen, but he says the goodness of God leads to repentance. And in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 12, it says this, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution from the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails or amounts to anything but a new creation. In Christ Jesus, we are a new creation. Both in the Old Testament and the New, it talks about the circumcision of our hearts, that God desires to make new people of us, to give us a new heart. My prayer for this whole study through the book of Romans is that God will continue to shape our hearts and, and, and our lives to be more like Christ. This is what God desires to do for us. And so the goodness of God in our life should lead us to humility and repentance. A desire to see God do the same work in others. Let that be the heartbeat of our church. Let's pray today. God, we thank you so much for your love and for your goodness to us. God, I know that you don't need us to accomplish your will. And yet, God, I'm glad that you use us to be a part of what you're doing. God, use us more. Use us to do greater things in this city and in this area, not for our own desires and our own pride, but God, for your honor and for your glory. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this letter to the church of Rome that Paul penned those thousands of years ago that speaks so clearly to us today. And God, I pray that your word would take hold and take root in our hearts even this week. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.